Hey, I'm Kristen A. Tumians. I'm the project planner assigned to the Woodlands Project. And tonight we're going to have the pre-application neighborhood meeting. So just a little bit of a house of housekeeping. There is a sign in a few sign in sheets going around on clipboards. Um, it's helpful if you could sign in. Um, that gives us an idea of how many people are attending. And it's a way um, to sign up for future updates. Uh, please sign as legibly as you can. And then um, to be able to speak tonight in an orderly way, um, we have some comment cards or speaker cards, sorry. Um, those aren't required, but it helps keep the comments uh, moving in an orderly fashion. There are comment cards for written comments. If you'd like to submit written comments tonight, there'll be other opportunities to submit written comments. Mike has, is holding them up right now. <laughs> or Mark, sorry, Mark is holding them up at the podium there. Um, you can also email or mail your written correspondence at any time, but if you'd like to submit those tonight, you can. Uh, just to let you know, the meeting is, will be recorded on YouTube, and um, we'll post it on the project website um, once it's available. And uh, just to respect everyone's time, because I know it's um, dinner time, um, the meeting will end promptly at 8. So we'll try to keep the meeting um, with a sharp uh, end time. And so this is my... Uh, Contact information, um, we have a dedicated email inbox for this project. So you can send comments at that email at any time. That's my uh, direct work uh, phone number. And there's a project website for the Woodlands. So what is the purpose of this meeting? It's the pre-application neighborhood meetings provide an opportunity for early input uh, by affected neighbors and serves as an open forum where neighbors can meet with the applicant team and get more information about a project. And they can ask questions and share feedback. Um, tonight, there are no decisions being made. This is really early on in the process, and it's sort of a first look at what could be submitted in the future. And just some, for some ground rules, unfortunately, we've had some uh, neg negative experiences recently at council and planning commission meetings. So the city is committed to creating a safe and inclusive environment free from disruption. And we will not tolerate any hateful speech or actions, including those on Zoom um, or any aggression towards staff or the applicant team. So we, we will be monitoring this meeting and ensuring that everyone is participating respectfully. So everyone has an opportunity to, to participate. Um, so if anyone's disruptive or disrespectful, they'll first be muted if you're on Zoom or at the podium and given a warning um, if the behavior continues, then you will be removed from the meeting. But hopefully that won't ha happen tonight. And then just to give you a brief overview of what the project is currently um, described as. Let me see my way. So Shin the woodlands at Sinead is a 71.62 acre infill site located along both sides of Sinead Road and Cobblestone Drive, west of Hidden Valley Drive north of Rolling Hill Drive and east of Sycamore Avenue and Nielsen Court. Historically, this property has been a site for a medical campus, as you, many of you know, and has been vacated for some time and it was sold to a developer. There are currently four active uses remaining on the site. Those include the county morgue, a public health laboratory, a bird rescue, a women's shelter, as well as a small cemetery. The applicant proposes to amend the current general plan uh, land use designation and rezone the property to accommodate future residential development. So the entitlements the applicant will request um, will be a general plan amendment rezoning. And those we uh, staff believes will require the preparation of an EIR, which is an environmental impact report. So what is a general plan? A general plan is a broad long range policy document that guides future development and conservation and is a comprehensive collection of goals and policies um, related to multitude of aspects of community life. And in California, cities and counties are required by state law to have one. Um, and it's sort of our blueprint for future development, what we wanna see in the city over an extended period of time. The zoning, uh, the zoning and zoning code um, zoning ordinance implement that general plan through um, detailed development regulations, such as you know, what kind of uses you have, what the building requirements are, like setbacks, height, parking, et cetera. 
And then what is an EIR, or Environmental Impact Report? It's an informational document used to assess physical characteristics of an area and to determine what effects will result if the area is altered by a proposed um, action or project. And this is prepared in compliance with our California Environmental Quality Act. And so the EIR, EIR will cover a multitude of different topics, like those listed behind me. Um, this is, uh, it, it could include more, but these are typically what is studied in EIRs and they include transportation, um, wildfire, um, and, ver and various other topics. So those would all be studied in the I EIR. And the site is currently um, designated public institutional um, both in the general plan and zoning. So it limits what can be um, developed on the site to um, public facilities, utilities, hospitals, um, like schools, libraries, government offices. So it's very limiting on what can be developed there. And the review process will be pretty um, intense. Once the application is submitted, there will be a notice of application mailed to residents. Um, Various um, entities will review the project, both in the city and outside of the city, different um, entities. And the city will have a request for proposal for an environmental consultant to assist the city in, in preparing the EIR. Uh, there, would be a, there will be a scoping session, which is a public meeting to determine the scope of the EIR. So that'll be another public meeting. Once the draft EIR is prepared, there'll be a notice of avail availability and a notice is mailed to the neighbors within a thousand feet to review the EIR. It's made public to the neighbors. And then uh, there'll be a public hearing before the planning commission to review the adequacy of the draft EIR. So that would be another notice that you would receive. And then once the final EIR is prepared, then there will be public hearings. So first it would go to planning commission who would make a recommendation to council and then council will make the ultimate decision on whether to certify the EIR and um, approve or deny the general plan amendment and rezoning. And so the items that I've highlighted in yellow are all the opportunities the public has um, to participate, comment, review, check in on the project. And with that, I will turn it over to the applicant team. They have a brief presentation. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you for attending in person and, and those on Zoom, the neighborhood meeting to discuss the future of the Sinead Road Hospital campus, or what we now are calling it as the Woodlands. My name is George Malouf, partner with Eddie Haddad, uh, and we are very excited to be a part of this project that will transform a historical site that is the largest of its kind in a generation. First, I'd like to give thanks to the city of Santa Rosa staff for coordinating the meeting. Uh, they've been very helpful in guiding us through the process and look forward to our continued work together. Also, I'd like to recognize our council member, Victoria Fleming, who has been very transparent with her immediate concerns over the maintaining of the property, thoughts for the future and neighborhood concerns. I think we're all very much aligned with the important aspects on the future of the Woodlands. Eddie and I have put together an amazing team of respected, professionals from Santa Rosa community to partner on the project. And to introduce them briefly, uh, I'd like to point out Keith and Amy Christofferson from Christofferson Builders. Christofferson, Bu Christofferson Builders has been building in Northern California for over 40 years with more than 7,000 homes in 63 communities to date. In addition to being voted Sonoma's County Builder of the Year for several consecutive years and winning JD Power Awards. Both Keith and his wife, Brenda, were inducted into the California Builders Hall of Fame in 2006. The firm's president, Amy, and Keith's daughter, is positioned to bring the same quality of customer service to their clients have expected to receive for the second generation home builder. We also have Eric Swinside, our land planning architect from Las Vegas based at Vance and Associates, and Jeff Coleman to my left from BKF Engineers who has extensive knowledge with the city of Santa Rosa ordinances and development standards. Lisa Mayo is here as our key point of contact for, me, uh, for media and community relations, who 
whose contact information is available to anyone uh, who would like to reach her. The 71 acre Sinead campus includes 17 buildings built between 1936 and 1994. All but two buildings are vacant. The Sonoma County Morgue and the Sonoma County Health Department have existing short-term leases and will be relocated to new buildings once complete. The property also includes a bird rescue center that will be relocated once their new facility is built. A historic cemetery adjacent to the 26 acre Pioneer Creek flood control reservoir. Nine acres of land along Pauline Creek is owned by the Agriculture Preservation Open Space District and includes parcel J with nine acres of land dedicated for public access and use. I'm going to make my comments brief so we have plenty of time for, for questions from, uh, from the neighbors. Uh, sorry? We're not there yet. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'd like to introduce Jeff, uh, uh, our, our project engineer. Thank you, George. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jeff Coleman. I'm a civil engineer, land surveyor and uh, a vice president of BKF Engineers. Uh, I'm not new to Sonoma County. I've been here for 40 years, or at least a resident for 40 years. And I've been practicing here for a little over 25 years. And so I, I first wanna thank the city of Santa Rosa for hosting this meeting. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for joining us this evening. Now, whether you're here with us at the council chambers or participating via Zoom, uh, we all realize your time is valuable. Your, uh, your presence is appreciated. And uh, we thank you for your interest in uh, helping shape the redevelopment of the former Sinead site. Now, the reason that I say help shape the redevelopment, shape the redevelopment of the former Sinead site is uh, um, because that's precisely what we're gonna be doing. Now, you may be wondering why we're seeking input when we have a, a concept master plan shown on the city's website, but uh, the only reason the concept plan was provided was so that we can show the city, uh, they had asked for one or more alternatives that demonstrated how the site could actually be developed. And so that's the reason that that concept was provided. And so the concept that's uh, shown on the website is not part of the upcoming application that's being submitted to the city uh, that Chris Sine was talking about a little while ago. And uh, again, the only thing that could probably be taken from that that would be of interest would be looking at the fact that we're proposing a combination of single family residential uh, townhomes and or apartments. Uh, but other than that, the, uh, the only site plan that you're gonna see with the upcoming application is the blank canvas that you see right now on the screen before you right now. And that's uh, the, the exhibit that's being uh, accompanied with the general plan amendment application. So we wanna thank Sonia and the friends of Sinead for meeting with us to help us understand the community's needs. Uh, we think we've got a pretty good handle on the community's concerns, and that's usually a great step to uh, planning a site. So we did hear that some of the community's concerns are traffic. Uh, we know that emergency egress is a concern. We know that the density of the development is a concern. And we know that people are concerned about the impact on schools and public services. And did I mention traffic? Because we all know that traffic is a concern. So. You know, these are all really important elements uh, that need to be studied and evaluated. And we'd like to hear if you have other concerns other than those. And more importantly, we wanna hear about the things you'd like to see within the development. So we're curious if you wanna see a market, uh, would you like to see a small park? Would you like pickleball courts? Uh, we learned talking to a number of people that uh, people wanted to see the trail system, the trail network that runs through Sonoma Waters property improves so you're not walking in ankle deep mud in the middle of the winter. And so these are things that we wanna hear. What are your desires coming out of this development? And so the purpose of this meeting is to answer your questions, is to hear your concerns, but more importantly, we wanna gather input to help shape this development because we don't have a site plan that's fixed. And so we also wanna keep you informed and keep you part of this process. And so the question, are there gonna be other meetings? The answer is absolutely, there'll be additional meetings. And so what are the next steps? As uh, Chris and A pointed out, the land use for this property is currently public institutional, and that's intended for public buildings, hospitals, schools, and government offices. None of us want that. We want a residential development out there, if anything at all. 
And so the current land use that's out there today is not congruent with the surrounding community. And so this really ranges from low density residential to the east, which is on the right in the graphic above, to medium density residential on the west, which is uh, can be seen by the, the small uh, orangey brown area on the left hand side of the yellow. Um, and so uh, we would really like to change the land use so that it's consistent with the surrounding uses. And so in order to do that, as Chris Ney had mentioned, the general plan amendment, the rezone and the environmental assessment are needed to, to accomplish that. And so the outcome of this process will actually drive the site plan. So we're looking at uh, running through a number of special studies and the environmental process is gonna help us establish that site plan. So again, right now, we don't have a fully vetted site plan and we're looking for input to help with that. So the, the existing site is naturally broken down to what are somewhat three distinct areas and we're calling them neighborhoods in the graphic above. So neighborhood C that's to the east on the right hand side is composed of approximately 30 acres. And we're currently proposing to rezone and, and reestablish the land use there as low density residential. And this is consistent with the areas to the south and the east. So in that exhibit on the right hand side and, and just below. And, uh, and so if you're kind of curious what this might look like, it's gonna look like the areas that are surrounding it to the east and to the south. And then Christina, if I can have you toggle down to them. Yeah. And so uh, with the exception of if, if the community wanted a small park and or the pickleball courts that I had mentioned before or something similar, then you know, those types of things could also be incorporated in the development. So as George mentioned earlier, he and Eddie, they, uh, they intend to partner with Christofferson Builders uh, for the single family residential homes. And many of you know Christofferson, it's a name that's been around Sonoma County for a very long time. And everybody that knows them knows that they take pride in the quality of the homes that they build. And in my opinion, they're some of the nicest homes in Sonoma County. So uh, on the screen before you right now is a rendering of a sim similar product that they're doing just over the hill over in Fountain Grove. And uh, this is also consistent with the zoning that's being requested in neighborhood C. So we are asking for a slightly higher density in neighborhoods A and B. And neighborhoods A and B, they're approximately 20 acres a piece, making up 40 acres. And so the zoning for those areas, uh, we're asking for the land use to be able to accommodate between eight and 18 units per acre. And again, that's consistent with the orangey brown area to the west, just west of the Schnate development. And uh, again, um, you know, a, a lot of people are going to ask the question, okay, how many homes are going to be built? And, you know, the answer to that is that we just don't know yet uh, until special studies are performed and we've completely vetted this with the environmental process. And until that happens, everything else is speculation. So, if we were strictly looking at the math, looking at the density ranges that are being requested, then we're talking about somewhere between 388 homes at the low end and 878 units at the high end. But again, this is gonna be a combination of single family homes, townhomes and or apartments. And whether or not we can actually achieve the higher end of the density, this is true of any development that we've ever worked on. Uh, we don't know the answer to that yet, again, until we go through that environmental process. But the, the actual density that we're able to achieve is gonna depend on constraints, the things that I mentioned earlier. It's gonna depend on roads, transportation, egress, um, fire safety, and all the things that we're gonna study through that process, including earthquake faults. So the next question everybody wants to ask is, uh, when can we expect to see a site plan? Uh, it might take a year to get through the environmental process. And uh, so we're looking at the end of 2024 and then we're gonna have a better understanding of our opportunities and constraints. And, um, and then once a real site plan is developed, it's gonna be shared with the community. And at that time, another neighborhood meeting is gonna be held and an application submitted to the city. So we've got multiple public hearings. So this very first step is just getting through that environmental process and trying to figure out what our opportunities and constraints are, mitigation measures will be developed. And it's with those mitigation measures that we're actually able to figure out, okay, what can we actually build out here? And so uh, how is emergency egress gonna be handled? And so our experts are gonna study this. They're gonna, like I said, evaluate this and determine what those mitigations measures need to be. 
And uh, that's gonna all be included in the environmental document that's gonna be produced. It's gonna be made available to the public and everybody's gonna have a chance to look at that environmental document next year before it gets taken to the council. And so uh, another question that um, people tend to ask is how tall are these units gonna be? Uh, we can tell you at this point in time that the single family homes are gonna be one and two stories, um, but we haven't figured out the rest yet. That's all gonna be determined. And so will there be commercial uses? Will there be a park? Will we have the pickleball? Are we gonna create a walking community? Uh, that's kind of up to you. And that's what we're here to obtain feedback for. And so with that, I'd like to get all of your thoughts on that. And I'm gonna turn this back over to Kristen A. Thank you. With that, thank you um, for your presentation. Uh, with that, we're able to get started with the public comments. We're gonna do in-person questions and comments first. And we've reserved some time um, around 7.15 or so for the Zoom, uh, people attending Zoom to be able to um, ask questions or give comments. Um, if you can, please keep your comments to two minutes. And um, if possible, try not to repeat the same uh, comment. Um, and we have some comment cards um, that Jessica has. So she'll call um, whoever submitted a comment or speaker card will come up to the podium. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. And just a quick introduction of myself. I'm Jessica Jones. I'm the deputy director for our planning division, overseeing both our current development pro uh, division and our advanced planning policy work. Um, so I'm going to be reading these uh, three at a time so that people can cue themselves up. So if anybody is out in the courtyard listening in, you'll hear your name and you can uh, come in to speak. Um, and as Kristen A mentioned, if we could try to keep it to two minutes just so that we can get as many people to have an opportunity to speak as we can. Um, should there be any questions, if these are questions that we could potentially answer, we will attempt to do that. We've got representatives from uh, most of our city departments here uh, in the chambers with us. Um, and for any questions that we can't answer tonight, um, and for any of those that we can, we're gonna be gathering all these questions and putting them together to create a frequently asked questions page um, that will be put um, as part of the project page on our website. So first up is going to be Jim Herson, followed by Bill Davidson, and then rental affordable housing. So we've got two podiums up at the top. You can pick whichever one you want. They are, they can be raised on the right-hand side. There's a toggle if you need to raise it up or lower it down. Um, and then if you could speak directly into the microphone, that would be helpful. Good evening, I'm Jim Herson, resident of Hidden Valley Estates. We just got... I guess I'm not short enough. Anyway. Jim Herson, resident of Hidden Valley Estates. We were part of the fire burnout. Uh, we just returned after the fire to find this proposal, which frankly, we're very concerned about. As a person who used to live on the East Coast, I have seen high density developments in many places. It never works out to the positive benefit of the neighbors to the development, ever. They result in higher crime, higher demand for social services, higher traffic problems, never anything that is a benefit. One of the things that I am most concerned about with this particular development, and I'm speaking specifically of the high density development now, is we just went through a period of 20% of mandatory water conservation. I assume there is a water study somewhere that has to do with the consumption of all of these giant apartment complexes and high, high uh, occupancy developments that are being made that is compatible with the time of drought, which is becoming more and more frequent. And to expect the citizens in the neighborhood to increase their conservation, to provide more water to a high density development is frankly unreasonable. So it raises the question, and the best thing question that I saw on the screen was, what are alternative uses? What should we do with this property rather than let it sit there and decay? 
the answer we think, at least my, in my family, is we should be looking at something like vocational training sites. We desperately need more urgent care facilities. If you go to Providence Hospital, to the emergency room, their gurneys are lined up on all of the walls with patients in them, people that don't really need emergency care, but can't wait four or five weeks to see their primary care physician if they have one. Jim, thank you for your comment. Your two minutes is up. Okay. And also just a quick note, if you are not able to get in everything that you want to say in the two minutes, um, uh, you can contact Kristen A through the email and we can, we'll put that up um, again later in the evening. Um, but uh, and there's also comment cards up at the uh, top of the chambers up here where you can write written comments and provide them tonight, but we'll have lots of ways for you to submit additional comments. Uh, so up next is Bill Davidson, followed by rental affordable housing and then Sam Walker. Thank you, Bill Davidson, um, resident of Hidden Valley. And I appreciate this time to be able to speak here. Uh, as far as potential uses for this land, while I see that something needs to happen other than a deterioration mode, I think something other than high density, low income housing might be in the offing. And what I feel that some of these state mandates are doing is that we are, you know, the, there's this whole idea about low pay and we have to support industries that don't pay very much. Well, how about we further our community with building um, opportunities that bring in higher paying jobs? So instead of perpetuating low pay and building high density, low income housing, why don't we use this land to develop a business park or some sort of further educational institution and perhaps do something like a business incubator to really bring something more to Sonoma County and Santa Rosa, <clears throat> excuse me. The other idea I'd like to float out is that should this project go through in the you know up to 900 uh, units that's being discussed, I, I think that the residents surrounding the, this, this area and perhaps the entire town might start to view this as a takings situation where our quality of life is being taken, our, um, our homes could potentially be further diminished in value. And I think that there needs to be something to along the lines to consider of inverse condemnation. So those are my comments, thank you. Thank you very much. Up next is uh, rental affordable housing followed by Sam Walker. And then uh, Nancy, I think it's Waxig. So we had somebody submit one just stating the name as rental affordable housing. Well, I'm Sam Walker, I guess. Okay, uh, yeah, go ahead, Sam. Okay, all I uh, had, we live in Cobblestone, and uh, you know the traffic on cops when you come down to Sinead and and getting on Sinead sometime can be really high risk adventure. And all I and then I see <laughs> that the possibility of this high density housing and even medium density housing and some of it may be coming right in the same area. And so the traffic would be multiply worse. It's not just traffic, but we, we've had, and we will continue to have in the future, where we have to evacuate. And I just cannot imagine such a thing when you have that many people as a possibility in coming onto the, the Sinead and uh, the roads around there. Thank you. Thank you very much. So up, up next is Nancy, I think it's Waxig, uh, then followed by Phil Wheel, and then Brian Mills. I think I need to correct my name. It's W-A-N-G. Oh, sorry about that. It's Wong. I'm 46 years resident at Henny Valley Drive. I'm so glad to hear you say low density. 
This is the only things I think everybody here, we want to hear. We don't want to be chaos. I hope everybody still remember 2017, we had to be back and wave on the fire. It's only Shane Row we can get out. We're fighting for our life to get out of there. Copper Stone um, and what's the Lomita Heights, Montecito Heights, Hinde Valley area, and Fountain Grove. We're all fighting our life to get out of there. I hope these things is not gonna happen again. Then also I would like you to keep your promising low density, please. Because without, I think you folks is the third developer county sold to turn over for different owners. And uh, the only one thing is we have a history cemetery out there because my personal, I worked at cemetery, we have a 2008, we delegate that cemetery. And because you block the road, we can't even go up there anymore. We're being stole and completely destroyed the history cemetery there. So I hope after you do some developer, low density, please, and keep public access open, we can go up there to pay our respect. Because that cemetery since 1886 has a lot of history there. This is a residential area. I think everybody here really want to be low density. Please, thank you. Thank you. Uh, up next is Phil Wheel, followed by Brian Mills, and then Sandy Stoddard. Thank you. Uh, I've come from an environmental point of view, and I find it cruelly ironic that in order to make this development called the woodlands, the oak trees and the redwood trees will need to be cut down. We've talked our Neighborhood has talked about wanting a buffer between the houses that currently exist that look back into a beautiful uh, natural area and what horrible possibilities there is for the future in that back area when the homes are built, the people are put in, their cars are there, their dogs are barking, their lights are on, et cetera. My suggestion is for the builders to come into the neighborhoods and do what Mr. Maloof said that uh, Communication is required and come meet in several of the houses so the neighbors can have a meeting rather than a large mega public forum like this and listen to what people are looking for, what we'd like to see when the land is developed safely and with the neighbors in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is Brian Mills, followed by Sandy Stoddard, and then uh, Bert Mendenhall. Hello, thank you for the time tonight. My name is Brian Mills. My family and I own the property on the corner of Parker Hill and Sleepy Hollow, which we just finished rebuilding after the Tubbs fire. My children attended Sleepy Hollow, or sorry, uh, Hidden Valley Elementary School. Uh, which is now completely overrun with students because even the satellite campus that used to exist was not rebuilt. Uh, so I've spent over 12 years now driving in and out of that neighborhood, rebuilding in it, getting to know the neighbors. I can definitely say that that neighborhood was built with the intention of low density housing, uh, one, uh, the R16 at best. Um, when I hear the initial comments about how this is being planned, what the ideas are, I don't think you're at all in line with what the neighborhood actually wants. I don't think we want a bunch of medium density or high rise buildings. We all saw what happened in Coffee Park when you have a bunch of homes shoved together or at the bottom of Fountain Grove where two large apartment type buildings, there were hotels burnt down completely. Uh, the idea that having a bunch of grammed together Christofferson homes and high rise apartments is what the neighborhood, even the community wants or what that area was designed for is completely out of step with what actually is needed in that area and what the surrounding community actually wants. So I do hope that you do hold yourself to your comments and to your pledge to listen to us and understand what's actually wanted and needed in that area and not create some amazingly out of step and out of place development that will cause nothing but chaos and problems like Jim described and bringing nothing but a lowering of the quality of life to that area. Thank you.
Thank you. Up next is Sandy Stoddard, followed by Bert Mendenhall, and I think it's Jacqueline Marcus. First of all, I'd like to apologize for my hearing problem. I, I missed most of the comments, uh, so I, I uh, apologize if I'm being re repetitious. Uh, I live in t uh, the area just behind the northern park parking lot of the old uh, Sutter Hospital. And uh, my concern is, uh, is traffic is, is, is concerned with lots of people. Uh, there's only one road which comes down into Sinead from our neighborhood. Uh, there's hundreds of homes up there. And you add on to that uh, somewhere where a thousand plus uh, cars with the new development. My question really is to the city, is there gonna be a, a, a traffic light added on to the uh, Terra Linda uh, uh, where it joins into Sinead? Uh, and that's, that's, my, that's my question, thank you. Thank you for that question. Thank you for that question. Um, with the environmental impact report, there will be a traffic analysis, a traffic study done along with the EIR that will um, analyze whether any sort of light or other types of mitigation are required. Um, we also have someone from traffic. I don't know if you have anything to add, but all of that will be analyzed as part of the EIR. Okay, up next is Bert Mendenhall, followed by Jacqueline Marcus, and then Tim McFarlane. I'm uh, Bert Mendenhall. I live a block from the Sutter, the old Sutter Hospital on Nielsen Road. I am now retired, but used to leave often for work, just as everyone's bringing their kids to school or going to school. It would take, even though there's a light up at the old Sutter Hospital, it would take a long time to get out of that. And somebody already said it, it you're taking your life in your hands. So yes, I'm talking about traffic and you've addressed it. Several people have addressed it. I've heard for many years that they're gonna put a lot of homes up there. I'm all for homes. I'm all for helping the veterans. But on our side of town, I'd like to see it go for, yeah, maybe a pickleball court. How about a swimming pool? How about another soccer field for the kids? It's not gonna make you money, but you are putting our lives at risk. Because I've, I've only looked at it as you can't widen Sinead Road. You're going to put stoplights for every side street? Or are you going to stack the road? I don't see any way to handle that much more traffic. Fountain Grove did not alleviate traffic on Sinead Road. Everyone takes it. That's all I have to say is I, I just, I want something else done with it or a combination, not as many homes as you could put in there. Thank you. Thank you very much. So up next is uh, Jacqueline Marcus, Tim McFarlane, and then I, uh, I'm going to, I apologize everybody if I'm mispronouncing names. I think it's uh, Piotr uh, Chimbalski. Hi, thank you very much. I was very pleased um, when you were um, making your presentation that you were going to include a park um, until you said small park because so many other areas in Santa Rosa have these big, beautiful parks like in Bennett Valley with a golf course and tennis courts and all this beautiful stuff. And Montgomery Village has a park at Doyle Park and Juilliard Park, and they're all over the place. We don't have such a park in our area. So I hope you seriously consider that. 
But what I really wanted to speak about, and I, I know other people have already, is the fire danger. I, I still have PTSD. We've been um, evacuated three times now in five coming on six fire seasons. It's um, a very fire prone area and very little egress in that area. So at most low density housing, beautiful park in there, I think it would be beautiful. But I did wanna add one thing to emphasize the fire danger there. I just lost a home in that horrible fire in Lahaina. And I actually have friends who had to, they left their car on Front Street with all the other cars where families burned to death in those cars because they couldn't get out. She, she's able-bodied, so she climbed over the brick wall down into the water. She survived. We don't have an ocean. We're stuck on Sinead or Hidden Valley or somewhere else, one of the other little side streets, and the fire is blazing and everybody is stopped in front of us and they can't go anywhere. We can get out of our cars, but there's nowhere to, for us to go. We can't jump into the Pacific Ocean like save some of the people in Lahaina, but it didn't save everybody who got caught in their cars. So please, but, I don't think me. we can emphasize this enough. Miss, your two minutes are up. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, up next is Tim McFarlane, followed yeah, I, by- I'll, I'll be brief, and I just wanna uh, add on to what was just presented. <clears throat> we we were presented with a similar project about five years ago. And the repetitive question at the time was uh, emergency exit on Sinead. Um, and I asked the question, when is it gonna be widened? And everybody laughed. The, since the city of Santa Rosa has had almost five years to deal with this question of adding 1,200, 1,500 cars, what's the plan? You've had five years to develop a plan. Where's the plan? That's real simple. It's an easy question. I haven't heard anything from anybody about a plan. And, and, and <clears throat> to follow up on the EIR with traffic, um, I can tell you the traffic is gonna be a mess. You don't need a study. It's real simple. It's gonna be a mess. So save your, save your money. Don't, don't waste your time doing a study on traffic. It's real easy. Thanks. We do have representatives from traffic and fire that could speak to either traffic or evacuation. We have Paul Lowenthal from our fire department and Torino Wilson from traffic. Hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. Hi there. I'm Tarina Wilson. I'm the transportation planner for the city of Santa Rosa. Um, I have a lot of thoughts and comments based on the comments that have been made by the public. And I, you know, it could take so long for me to answer all of the questions. Um, I agree, you know, there's traffic on Sinead and we know as a community and as a nation that we can't build our way out of congestion. Um, and even in, you know, moments of intense evacuation, which I know we've experienced many times, there's no community where the entire transportation system can accommodate your whole city evacuating at the same time. Um, and so that's an issue that, that, you know, the city really cares about. And we try to look at, um, I did pull the traffic counts from Sinead in preparation for the meeting tonight. Um, and so you know, I can share that with the planners who can share it with, um, I, I heard there would be some sort of frequently asked questions page put up so you can have that information. The main issue with um, evacuation, as far as I know, is intersections. Um, our intersections are smaller and we don't have the right of way in a lot of cases to then widen them so that you would have enough um, access for egress. So um, the, the traffic impact analysis that will have to happen as part of this project it's going to look at all of the intersections and it's going to have to make recommendations on what kind of things can be done um, 
to help mitigate the impact of the project. So um, I know that the report is going to tell you that traffic is rough. That's the point of the report. So the, the point of the report is to say, here's what the impact is going to be, and here's a couple ways that we can help remedy these issues. Um, and that happens before the project gets approved. So you get to see that before it goes to your city council members and before they approve the project. So you then have another step to read that report, um, make your own determination based on the report and the mitigation that's put in it, and then, you know, then comment to your council members. Okay, up next is, uh, and I apologize for the name, Piotr uh, Chimbalski, uh, followed by James Barnes, and then Blake Hillegas. Good evening, thank you. It's it's Peter Simbalski. I live north of uh, uh, Coddington. Oh, is that better? I live north of Coddington. It's Peter Simbalski. No hard feelings, by the way. I've had lots of substitute teachers have way worse pronunciations than that. So <laughs> water under the bridge. Um, when the purchase of the property went through, there was a public plan which discussed uh, mixed use development. I think that's a great idea. Uh, neighborhood mixed use, NMU, creates sociable, walkable, fiscally stable urban regions. They reduce car traffic by bringing workers and customers directly to the shops. You can go downstairs to get groceries or get a haircut or anything. Uh, they reduce uh, their sociable, walkable spaces because those shops you go to every day become third places, places that are neither home nor work where you can relax and socialize. They maybe create more economic activity than a similar purely commercial space or purely residential space because, of course, the increased interaction and the, frankly, increased density. In terms of dollars per acre, they are very effective and help pay for their own infrastructure much more than uh, single family detached or low density commercial. Why was the NMU plan scaled back? Uh, as, as we've seen, now we're looking only one shop, say. What happened to more M NMU uh, zoning and can the city encourage that use? And as a quick aside, can the city help the development become uh, resident-owned co-ops or co-op or network of those? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, up next is James Barnes, followed by Blake Hillegas, and then Charlene Staples. Yep. Um, I live in Cobblestone, and as most of you know, Cobblestone is uh, surrounded by most of this project. Um, Cobblestone has one way in and out. And I was there during the Tubbs fire, and we could not get out. We could not get on to, to Sinead. It was impossible. We sat there for extended periods of time because nobody, everybody, like this one lady said, were afraid for their lives and left uh, and wouldn't let anybody in. And so it's up to the city of Santa Rosa, all you folks down there, to protect the citizens of Santa Rosa. The plan that I've heard here really does nothing to allevi alleviate the problem that we had in 2017. As far as I can tell, nothing is going to happen to Sinead that's going to enable it to withstand the traffic onslaught, particularly in light of an emergency, be it a fire or an earthquake. And so an earthquake would have the similar effect of not being able to get out. And so um, we've, I look to the city of Santa Rosa and you folks, the city employees that ostensibly work for the citizens of Santa Rosa to um, protect the, the, the people that live there and not allow an immensely dense project to go through that will basically, um, if, if there's another fire, it'll be a death uh, sentence for the people of Cobblestone in particular. I can move fairly well, but some of my neighbors wouldn't be able to get out. I, I, under any circumstances. And so uh, we need to have a plan that is also consistent with Cobblestone. None of the plans here um, are, and, and the other neighborhood areas, uh, and take into account the historic uh, problem with um, the events that that um, 
occurred in the 2017. And as far as the question- Excuse me, sir, wait. your two minutes are up. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then also just, just a reminder, we do have comment cards. If you want to um, get additional comments in, um, we'd be uh, more than happy to take those. Um, okay, Blake Hillegas, followed by Charlene Staples, and then Frank uh, Egger. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Blake Hillegas, and I live at 3573 Sinead Road, homeowner on Sinead, uh, next to the Hidden Valley School. Um, just speaking from my perspective tonight, and uh, I support housing. Um, I support uh, balanced housing with the amenities that are also to be provided, um, whether it's low density townhouses or apartments or all three. Um, my biggest concerns are traffic on Sinead, not from a, you know, too much traffic standpoint, but the speed of traffic coming down the hill or going up and passing in the center turn lane. So it's really just an enforcement issue of the speeds on Sinead. But I understand there's little enforcement because there's other priorities. However, if there's anything that would help me would be the speed on Sinead um, and just getting people to slow down a little bit. I don't care if we in, there's increased traffic, but what you have to think about is there is a school there. It's a it's an elementary school, and um, you know there's people coming down that hill super fast, and I would appreciate some traffic calming. Um, besides that, in the development, um, I think that recreational amenities and open space are important. Important. I think there's a great opportunity for this development to incorporate the existing open space, the uh, water agency property and make that not just a private amenity. I think the development needs to provide their own recreational space, private amenity, but they also need to look at the public amenity and connections to that open space and to that water agency property and make it a community asset if you can. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is Charlene Staples, followed by Frank Egger and then Thomas Ells. Hi, I'm Charlene Staples. I just have four points. My original was, could the planning for a traffic light at Terra Linda, Lanita Heights be included right from the beginning of the, um, of the planning process? My second is I implore the city, the traffic department, the safety department to get moving on Shanate Road and other roads in Santa Rosa that are difficult for evacuation. The third is I really like the idea of having sports fields uh, I didn't hadn't thought of that myself, but whoever brought that up, that's a desperately needed um, issue in our part of the neighborhood. Uh, I like the idea of starter homes, uh, parks, and making a walking neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is Frank Egger, followed by Thomas Ells, and then uh, Hulan Liu. Thank you. Frank Ager here. The Ager family has been in Sonoma County since 1918. I graduated from Santa Rosa JC in 1960. My wife, Renita, graduated from Montgomery High School in 1959. We live in Fairfax full time, but we own a family home on Franklin Avenue. I fought the Hanley Fire off of Marin County Fire Engine in 1964. We saved Mark West Springs Lodge. We fought that fire and we stopped it with two other engines. From there, we went up to Wikiup and fought fires for the week. The weekend of the, of the Tubbs fire, we were working the Sonoma County Harvest Fair all weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and headed home back to Fairfax. It was an eerie, eerie feeling that night. I woke up about one in the morning and I put my scanner on and I heard a ring down for 10 engines to come out of Marin County to go to Santa Rosa. We started calling family and friends to get out. They got out, but they lost everything. Homes gone, everything they own gone, their history gone. Fire follows fire. The Hanley fire, the Tubbs fire, and the next fire will take out Sinead too. 
You know, there was no Fountain Grove fire in 60, there was no Fountain Grove in 64. Friends in Fountain Grove lost their, put their homes. So, so evacuation is, is, is the whole story here. Let's not set us up for, for death and destruction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Up next is Thomas Ells, followed by Huhan Liu, and then Helen Efren. Well, thank, thank you for the opportunity to speak and, um, and coming to a forum here. Um, my name is Thomas Ells, and I'm a civil and environmental engineer. And um, when Fountain Grove was being finished, I, I've said this sometimes before, admitting my own uh, uh, lack of understanding that this man has. At the time, people said that a fire was going to come, follow the Hanley fire, and it was going to jump the freeway. That was just unheard of. It was impossible to believe that. It absolutely did that. Okay, so, and I went up and I saw places that were pasture that the fire went across 900 feet. Hot fire, intense fire above the ground, crossed 900 feet of, of just stubble grass. Uh, it's kind of things you just can't imagine. Um, many, many things are, are quite unusual in these fires. We don't really understand them. Um, so I just really look forward to seeing and, and hearing from you in response to all of these comments of how you're going to address these, because it is very important to this community. Uh, I have great experience as a civil engineer. I did a lot of development and, um, these are very unique compared to where most developments have been because they're mostly been in flatlands, very regularized patterns of, of roads with a lot of um, uh, accesses and intersections and, and egress, right? This doesn't have that. So please take care and, and listen to the, the community here. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is Wuhan Liu, followed by Helen Efren, and then Aaron Myers. I could be pronouncing the name wrong. Um, it's spelled H-U-L-H-A-N, and then Liu. Uh, I, I'm from Cobblestones, and uh, I think I, I totally agree is uh, for most of the people they already mentioned is the, uh, about how terrible the, the fire in uh, 2017. And I still had to vivid remember the day. Because uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, in our community at the day, I think, uh, uh, luckily, uh, it's not get any fire, you know, the single house. And but at the time, is in our community, one of the uh, the neighborhood is the, in the backyard. Uh, the, is is <clears throat> there's another ember fire, and I, I see the you know the big fire is the behind the uh, the yard in in the open area, and uh, many old trees is uh, is the uh, in the burned down, and. Uh, you know, our community is to help each other because uh, by the time there's no any fire truck is coming. And uh, we have to help each other to connect all the uh, garden host, you know, put down the, the amber fire. So uh, until I think, uh, I think wait about uh, more than a couple hours or three hours and probably around noon time, the fire truck is finally is coming. And uh, so I, I feel very lucky, you know, our community is, is not, uh, not, not any single house is that destroyed. But uh, my, my heart fail is to go to all the home, you know, is that burn down, like, uh, 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 you know, is around the area, uh, like a Fountain Grove. 
for example, right? And <clears throat> in terms of the, I think is the, I think the, the main concern is the safety issue. If any, you know, uh, emergency, there's no, no way to evacuate it. And because uh, the, the I, I don't think the Shinevo- Excuse me, is, sir, your two minutes are up. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, up next is Helen Efren, followed by Aaron Myers, and then Cheryl Fields. I'm Helen Efren. I live on Quebec Terrace off of Franklin Avenue. And I, I agree that the intersections are a big concern. And there's also many driveways that come into Sinead along Franklin and possibly Sinead in terms of, you know, one road out of big neighborhoods. And right now, it can take a long time for me to get out of my cul-de-sac because of the traffic on Franklin, which is an extension of Sinead. With, so, you know, there's obviously the safety issues, but then there's the quality of life issue because you can't have a traffic light and a stop sign at every single street and driveway. And it's just, I just don't see how Franklin and Sinead, and well, those are the main, the main where the main impact will be can accommodate that much traffic and how people are going to get out of their driveways and streets safely with that increase in traffic. My other concern is earthquakes. Um, it's a red earthquake zone. It sits right on the Rogers Creek Fault. During the Napa quake, lightning came out of my front yard. I had new cracks in my foundation and my garage. This is a serious risk that's as serious as fire. So we have two major risks of fire and earthquake and evacuation. So that, that needs to be considered in terms of the density as well. Okay, up next is Aaron Myers and followed by Cheryl Fields and then Hannah Fields. Ask the uh, members here in the audience a question. Can I ask the, everyone in the audience a question? Sure. Okay. How many, everyone here, how many were affected by the 2017 Tubbs fire? Either order to evacuate on standby or whatever. Okay. And to the gentleman who fought the Hanley fire in 64, thank you for your service. So obviously the main concern here is evacuation during a fire and it's gonna happen again. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, I'd like to see the plan. Uh, how is that gonna happen? Tubbs fire 2017 redo. I, I don't think it's gonna work with an additional 878 units and how many more people? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Up next is Cheryl Fields, followed by Hannah Fields, and then Sarah Kelly. I'm Cheryl Fields. I live near this development. I don't, I don't just, I've been at all these meetings for years now, and I would love to be heard to say that I'm pro-housing, I'm pro-low-income housing, but it's in the wrong place that they keep trying to put it. It's because you're trying now to make a high density or even low density place where it was never planned for because it was planned as public use community hospital and the neighborhoods grew up around it. My main concern is obviously safety. If there's wildfire, we all heard that, but let's just think about what it's like on one day, 878 homes. If we just let them go to work and come back, that's, 3,512 more cars on the road. That's just to let them go out to work and come back. If you anticipate each home has two cars, that's 7,024 cars on the road on Sinead every day. We all agree that it's very impacted now. How will you mitigate that? Putting in stoplights will make it even harder 
at more intersections. Again, it's a development that needs to be very low density, more open space so that you don't create more quality of life issues, not just threatening people in a wildfire, but just every day. Thank you. All right, up next is Hannah Fields, followed by Sarah, Sarah Kelly, and then Mike Murado. Hello. Let's see. Oh, yeah, I can hear it. Okay. So I'll just be brief. I was happy to hear that you have some plans for the cemetery, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about that when the plans come out. I also wondered if you guys had any plans for any other archaeological sites that you might uncover when you start doing stuff around in that area. When I was growing up in that area, I heard that there were, you know, Native American sites uh, in that area. And I was wondering if you guys had plans for if you run across those sites, what are you going to do about them? Are you going to, you know, put them in a museum? Are you going to leave them there? Just kind of wondering if that was considered in the plans. <laughs> Thank you for that question. There will be a cultural um, resource study that includes potential archeological resources. Also, because this is a, um, includes a general plan amendment, um, the city is required to um, initiate a tribal consultation for the project. And we would be working uh, very closely with the tribes on this project. And there, the EIR will identify any mitigation necessary to pr um, preserve those artifacts. Okay, up next is Sarah Kelly, followed by Mike Morado. Hi, my parents are one of the original homeowners in Hidden Valley back behind the school. They built their home in the early 70s when there was just grassland everywhere. I went to Hidden Valley Elementary School. I worked at Sutter Hospital. I now live in Hidden Valley myself in the neighborhood I grew up in and love. The city streets around that neighborhood cannot be impacted the way that your plan has them developing. They just can't hold that infrastructure is not there for it. Um, you've heard many people here tonight raise a number of very, very good uh, points to be considered. And so I ask of you to, as developers and as someone in the real estate industry, to think about proactive accountability for our community and also for the wildlife interface with Pollen Creek. Uh, that has been a green belt itself for wildlife throughout that northeast pocket of Santa Rosa. Um, the water system is a huge concern as well with an additional 300 to 800 units and how you're going to get water um, into that area um, responsibly. And I also would ask for you to talk to those who've been here and know of the the need for community in that area. Um, Fountain Grove lost a deli with Traversos, a long time establishment here in the community. They also lost Sweet Teas, which was a restaurant that you couldn't find a seat some nights. Um, those kind of live use, mixed use, commercial living situations can work. Um, they've worked before in that portion of the community and it would help reduce the overall traffic that's, that you're looking at putting um, on the infrastructure around. You don't need a traffic um, study. Go stand in front of Hidden Valley School when the elementary school is being let out in the afternoon, and I encourage you to stand on Benita Vista and see for yourself the impact that's already taken right there. All right, up Good next evening. is... Oh, sorry. Oh, just, yeah, just real good. So Mike Morata, you're up next. And yes. then uh, after Mike, uh, we will go to our Zoom comments. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Morato. I live on Cobblestone Drive. My family has been here in Santa Rosa for 123 years. I was raised here. When I was 21 years old, I fought the Hanley Fire out in the Mark West area. And after an entire day and night of fighting it there, I went to Cloverleaf Ranch where I was working and fought there the next day. The 
Tubbs fire that all of you know so much about followed essentially the same footprint as a Hanley fire. And before those two, we had the great fire of 1870. What we have here is a pattern, not a unique situation, but a pattern. And also as an environmental specialist with more than a half a century of experience working with CEQA and many federal and other state legislations well, I can tell you that this project as proposed is fatally flawed. And the developer needs to hear this now and take it to heart because the environmental process is not going to take one year. I've been involved in billions of dollars worth of projects, hundreds altogether over the entire Western US and a project of this magnitude, even to go through the CEQA process will require something like three or four years and multiple millions of dollars to perform. So my argument again is that this project is fatally flawed, not for what it is or proposes to do, but where it is proposed to be built. Okay, we'll go to Dwayne DeWitt and then uh, we'll go to the Zoom callers after. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt, I'm from here. And we need to talk about transfer of development rights. The city should negotiate a land swap for Mr. Haddad to get downtown land for high density housing of over 900 residential units on city owned land. This would truly be city centered growth and can be achieved downtown. The city technically exists for the health, safety and welfare of its residents has already been mentioned. The point here is this is a fire zone. I was here during the Hanley fire my grandfather was out there fighting it. I was watching the flames as a nine-year-old. This is common sense. Mr. Haddad can make a whole bunch more money with downtown land, which is already owned by the taxpayers right here across the street. Other sites, you're doing the parking lots. So Mr. Haddad and your partner, look to how you can make as much money as possible by doing a transfer of development rights based on how many units you could have got up there at Sinead, where I used to work at Community Hospital, and say we want to get a thousand units in downtown Santa Rosa in high density multi level buildings close to the transit that you already talk about, because you're always blowing smoke about resiliency and sustainability and all these less vehicle miles traveled. Well, it's time to put up or shut up. Let your talk do the walk. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. So we're going to move to uh, comments on Zoom. And before you do that, um, I know that we've gotten some questions and comments on the Zoom feature. I just want to let everybody on Zoom know that we are collecting those comments and questions. Um, they'll be included um, with the project file, just like the written comments that are received here. Um, and just with like with every question that we're getting, we will be putting those together uh, for a frequently asked questions portion of our website. So if we could go to the Zoom callers, please. Holly Holcomb, I'm gonna send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Hello, is Holly Holcomb, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, I'm a resident of Glen Echo Drive, 3352 Glen Echo Drive. We, we've been here for about 12 years and my five-year-old daughter and I were forced to evacuate during the Tubbs fire in 2017. It was horrific and I was afraid my daughter and I were going to die in our car. So I'm concerned that these developers despite their best interests, don't understand the realities of those of us who live in this community. And I will hope that they will take that into consideration 
with their future plans. Although we realize there is a need to develop this neighborhood and this space, we hope it's done in a way that appreciates our, our community as it is. And we're a beautiful community. We're a natural community. We're an organic community who doesn't need thousands of more cars on the streets. We need safety. And we hope these developers will appreciate that. Thank you so much. Trevor Jones, I'm sending you a prompt to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Um, I, I grew up in Santa Rosa and I want to see it become a more equitable, sustainable and less car dependent city. I think this project is a really incredible opportunity to address our housing shortage while also working toward our climate goals. Um, I think we need to make sure that new residents of this community have access to a variety of transportation options. I think this is a really a way we can alleviate traffic concerns without reducing density. And one way we can do this is by adding a new bus route on Chine and by improving cycling and pedestrian infrastructure on the road. Um, the bus route that I'm proposing should connect Keysight, this new development, Safeway, Santa Rosa Junior College, Santa Rosa High School, downtown, and Snort. Um, I think that in terms of bike lanes, we should put protected bike lanes on this street, which would also help with traffic calming, and we should improve the sidewalks so that people can walk down the hill in, to Safeway or something if they wanted to, or ride their bike. Um, this all these things, in addition to having neighborhood markets and other amenities within the community would help reduce the traffic without needing to reduce the density on every trip. We desperately need more affordable housing in California and we need to encourage sustainable development of our cities. Thank you. Sarah Jones, I'm sending you a prompt to unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Sarah Jones, and I teach at Santa Rosa Junior College, and I live in the neighborhood, and I ride my bike to work every day. And I think we desperately need better bike routes so we can be less car dependent. There's no way to build enough infrastructure for the cars. Um, so we need to start riding public transit and riding our bikes and um, being much less car dependent. Um, the bus routes uh, need to go from this community to the major um, schools as well as Kaiser and Sutter and Keysight so that people can get from these places to their workplaces on public transit in a reasonable amount of time without having to drive their cars. We need to completely rethink how we get around the community. And everybody needs to do this, not just the people in downtown Santa Rosa. Thank you. If you wish to make a comment on Zoom, you can do so by re selecting the raise your hand icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'm not seeing any hands raised on Zoom. Jack Dupree, I'm gonna send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Uh, 
Go ahead, Jack. Jack, you're unmuted. You can um, go ahead and start your comment. Okay, this is uh, Jack and Marsha of Lost Dupre. Um, it was so crowded, for which I am extremely thankful that everyone, all of you people who were there showed up, that we could not get inside. That's that's probably good news. Um, and many thanks to uh, Sonia Taylor and Joanne Thomas, uh, who have been involved in this uh, Friends of Sinead. This is obviously um, a project that has many things to like, but more things to dislike. We do not need this project here. I echo Dwayne DeWitt's comments 100%. They can do the real estate transfer, get this project downtown, more to the city center where we have more facilities so that we can get more people, you know, in public transit, riding their bikes, etc. Please do not play with people's lives trying to survive in this high highly, you know, dangerous area by putting more people there. It is unfair. It is just not realistic. So please let us get that resituated um, and get that real estate transfer. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone else on Zoom who would like to make a comment? Please raise your hand. Okay, um, it looks like we don't have any other comments on Zoom, but yes, I'm seeing some hands here. If there's anybody who wasn't, who did not fill out a card, it wasn't required. So please you can go up to the podium um, to speak. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for what has been a, a very thought-provoking evening. My name is Anthony Lim. I'm a family physician. I, I came out to Santa Rosa in 2010 to attend a family medicine residency at the old Sutter Hospital. So I've delivered babies uh, in that hospital and brought new lives into this world. And so that piece of land means a lot to me. And I think hearing the people's comments tonight, that's very evident. I'm sure that the people thinking about developing this had added and all. I think I, I don't want to doubt the intentions, but to me, the real problem is that well-intentioned as it may be, I don't know that the people in charge of developing this really care about the land, like are really putting the community uh, first. And so to me, the solution going forward is very simple. Either somehow have a change of heart where you truly are having these neighborhood conversations in people's homes and really listening to the community and really value the needs of the community above any financial monetary interests or affect the transfer of this land into the hands of a truly well-intentioned group of people that knows this community, listens to this community and wants to see what's best for this community going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Um, hello, my name is Jennifer Dion, and I live on Hidden Valley Drive. Uh, my backyard is adjacent to the Plan C area. Um, my husband and I spent a few years digging around the city of Santa Rosa and uh, county uh, departments trying to understand why the water load that comes off of the mountain um, east of Hidden Valley Drive, the whole water flow comes down where the lowest elevation along Hidden Valley. And there's an easement under our property where um, that whole water load drops right down behind our house. Um, the toe of the slope is, it, during continuous rain, it floods at the bottom there. Um, in our digging, the only thing we could find was at the um, Public Works Department, there was plans in 1963 to have a V-ditch 
placed at the bottom of the slope on that county property. And it was never built, even though the engineer signed off on it. And our homes along Hidden Valley Drive are on landfill. So you can imagine the amount of water that flows from that huge area, the mountainside, all the way down through this culvert that just drops right onto the dirt behind our house is causing our house to slide along with some of our neighbors. And city uh, denied our claim with no explanation. County doesn't wanna take responsibility. And so I have questions about how are you gonna make my higher elevation um, of about an eight foot drop um, come and connect up with your planned community so that I'm not, my backyard isn't sitting Excuse on top me. of- Excuse me, the public comment period is over. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anybody else in the chamber who'd like to speak? Go ahead. Hello. I'm Cameron Blotter. I live on Hidden Valley Drive, and I'm uh, also a Keyside employee. So I thought it's worthwhile to have a voice for uh, Keysight. You know, we're a top tech company, and we've, you know, hired hundreds of young engineers that are looking for homes. Uh, they're probably looking for low density, you know, considerable you know, homes that are similar in the area, for sure. Um, I'm also thinking, you know, a general theme. I'm a, as an engineer, I'm interested in, you know, solving a problem. And I think everything revolves around how, what do we do with Sinead? And I haven't heard, you know, anything evolve changing Sinead. And I think that is essential for, you know, making this a worthwhile project. You know, we're talking about you know, safe bike lanes to be important, widening the roads, providing cobblestone, maybe a, a, a merging path to get onto Sinead. You know, I think there's a lot of infrastructure you could do with doing something about Sinead. So having a solution there, I think is essential for this to work. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the chambers that would like to speak? Oh, go ahead. Hi, my name is Robin Kuhn. I live right off of Montecito Meadow, which is right off of Sinead. And the, here, listening this evening, what really I hear a lot about is the traffic, which is a very realistic problem. And I think it's really, and not to sound disrespectful, but I think it's really important for the city and the planning and the traffic people to sit down with the developer and figure out a solution. You know, there could be alternate entrances or exits added or maybe different roads put in. But there needs to be a concrete method to solve the problem if we're going to go forward with this kind of development. I think most people here are not against development. It just needs to be responsible and thought out what to do. So I really want to urge the city to take a strong look at and work with the developer and come up with some concrete plans that'll work. That's all I got to say. Great, thank you. All right, looks like we've got another speaker over here. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Greg. Um, just wanted to say, my wife and I just took a trip up to Southern Oregon. We're over Crater Lake looking down, looking at Shasta. Another car pulls up, couple gets out. We start chatting a little bit. One of them asks, where are we from? And I say, Santa Rosa. And they grin, where do you think we're from? Santa Rosa. It didn't take 10 seconds for the conversation to turn to, where were you that night? Did you have to evacuate? Do you know anybody else who had to evacuate? Do you know anybody whose house burned down? How long was your power out? My wife describes this perfectly. If you just scratch below the surface, we're all still there. Someone said they had PTSD. I think everybody in this room had, has PTSD. If you think 800 units can go in this slot, you guys don't get it. That's all that we were trapped that night. We aren't pleading for our safety. We are pleading for our lives. I hope you consider it. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Jill Richardson. Apparently you already know that we're worried about traffic. We're worried about evacuation. 
And I think you're getting a. Can you speak idea. more into the microphone, please? This, this, community, this community has been traumatized. Um, we're not your average community looking at a new development. I, like most of my neighbors, did lose my house. We rebuilt our house. We came together as a community. We became very educated. We, were, we had to become very educated on how we would rebuild our community, how we would work with the city. I see representatives here from the departments that supported us. We pay attention. And when I hear, well, there could be eight to 18 units per acre, I think, okay, so what happens when you pencil it out? It's 18 or it's more. We've been through these things before. It's going on with the developmental system center right now where there was a plan in place. Oops, I'm sorry, it didn't pencil out. Now we're gonna make more units, more density. We wanna be able to trust you, but we're skeptical as a community. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we've got another speaker over here. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm sorry, I'm new to the Santa Rosa area. So I'm, it's been very educational in hearing and my heart is felt for the fire as I was not here for that, but yeah, I can understand that impact. Um, as a newer person, I was actually more, con I had a concern about the schools. Um, since I understand that the satellite school burned down and there is just a, the Hidden Valley Elementary, which my daughters attend with the proposal of the new housing and new families coming in on top of that congestion, just wondering how one of the largest schools and, and lower funded is going to accommodate um, new enrollees. And also with the change in the, the, the law for the TK, that's gonna increase as well in our general families. Um, and, and so I think I just, I'm just curious because I know that the things will move forward if in any regard, uh, just what will happen with education. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So this project would be referred to the school district that isn't affected and um, they would be able to plan for um, the number, proposed number or projected number of children that would live in this area should the project move forward. Hello, my name is Rosemary Berg and I live in Hidden Valley. And I've listened to all this tonight and I really don't think you guys get, we're scared. And I, I would suggest to get to know the community. You just go out on Sinead on any day of the week when the school gets out or goes in, you can't even get through. And, and where are all those kids you're putting in gonna go to Hidden Valley? It's bursting at the seams now. Um, but mostly how in the heck are we gonna evacuate? I have a way out. I have other ways out because I'm farther down in Hidden Valley. But I have a friend that can't get out of her Jeremy Court to take her kids to Hidden Valley School because the traffic out there is so bad in regular times. And then rush hour. By the time you put like a thousand more houses in there, a thousand more people in there and all the cars, it's you haven't thought this through. You'll all go back to Las Vegas or wherever you're from, and we'll be here with the mess you leave behind. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the chambers that would like to speak? Do we have? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, just uh, I know I've already spoken once, but I think everyone else had a chance. I did have a question that uh, came to mind, which I don't know if there's actually a way to study the impact of, but because I do live in the area, the Hui area, the upper Hidden Valley neighborhood, uh, several of my neighbors and I know ourselves, we've had uh, quite an issue with trying to keep insurance for our homes. A lot of it have been raised significantly. Others have been canceled without being able to find additional uh, insurance companies that will cover their home. So it would be nice to know what the impact of adding upwards of 800 new homes requiring fire insurance into our neighborhood would do not only to the idea of a low income house, which will have an additional three to $400 a month in fire insurance, but how it will affect the cost of our, or even our being able to hold on to our policies in the area when you create a, a higher density pub, uh, population within a fire zone like that. Thank you.
Thank you. I see we've got one other person uh, in the chambers here. We also have three more hands raised on Zoom. So we'll go ahead to the uh, gal here in the chambers, and then we'll move over to Zoom. My name is Liz Lockett. I live on Hidden Valley Drive. Um, the two subjects that I wasn't hearing until recently are the schools. That was number one. Like, where are these kids going to school? I work at a school district, and it just makes my mind go <laughs> big. Um, the second one is, and this sounds really nimby, but it's wildlife. And I know there's this, this study, these studies, series of studies that are going to happen, but there is amazing rich wildlife in that section. There are, there's a buck right behind my house yesterday, actually it was in front of my house. And I was worried for it because it was on the road in front of my house and not back in the field. Um, you know, there are coyotes, which are totally natural and we worry about our cats, but they should be there. And there are, it's so rich with wildlife. It's not just a plot that's downtown or somewhere else just sitting there with, with, you know, grasses and who knows, just kind of sterile or appears sterile. This is a really rich location. And I've said for years when talking about this project, are we going to pave over, you know, uh, Golden Gate Park in San Francisco because they need more housing? Are we going to pave over, you know, the, the? This is such a magical green space that our I consider our neighborhood pretty highly dense dense right now, and to not have a break um, for the wildlife and for the people is really tragic. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go ahead and go to Zoom now. Oh, Shannon Fields, I'm sending you a prompt to unmute yourself. Hi, hello. Um, I'm a resident from Sycamore Avenue, and I saw the Tubbs, uh, um, the Tubbs Fire swallow up Fountain Grove while I was waiting to see if it would cross the line. Um, the mandatory evacuation line, which was at the base of our hill. <laughs> um, so we were like 100 feet from the evacuation line. And if the fire hit that line, it would have gone whew, straight up. So from what I can hear, the, the housing shortage, while a pressing issue, is a very familiar and recurring issue ever since I was a child. And I remember hearing stories about developers like Tex Tuxhorn and so many others just coming in making promises to make equitable, affordable housing, and then nothing would really come of it. So I have a couple questions. One, what's happening to the land downtown that we can use and we can develop to make more affordable housing? I'm sure we can find ways to reallocate resources and property and improve the downtown in a more thoughtful way that's more long-term instead of short-term, maybe making more lighted sections, more safe, secure areas. We can use what we have that's available there instead of putting it in land that's honestly not safe to build on, especially due to the fire danger due to climate change. And uh, two, why is this land that we've had here, it was set aside to be a natural wildlife corridor, but it seems to keep coming up again and again as a place to redevelop when we already have other places downtown. We need to make sure this land is not on the chopping block because if we chop it, then the Pollen Creek project and so many other projects we had to improve and grow our city, especially in the face of climate change, what's gonna happen to all that? I'm very, very concerned about that. Thank you. Susan Smith, I'm sending you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, while I was waiting, a couple people did bring up something that I had sent you a question on, and that was, nobody really had discussed the insurance. Many people are being dropped by their fire insurance. And on top of it, a lot of these companies are leaving the state too. So I think that is a huge concern. How's this all gonna be insured? How are people gonna afford it? Is it gonna affect the people that already live here and have insurance? Will we be dropped? So I think there's a real issue there. The other thing is 
where does the water come from? I never hear anybody answer that. We have so much building going on right now all over Santa Rosa in the new apartments and housing and townhouses and that. And again, I know somebody did mention that we did have to cut back during the drought 20%. And I think everybody in Sonoma is on board with that type of community effort. But what happens when we keep being told in all these communities, there's not enough water, but we continue to build. Where does this water come from? And how does it affect the people that are already here? Those are my questions. Um, Lonnie, uh, uh, can we have uh, Andy Allen um, speak to the water question? I think he's a panelist. Good evening. Sorry, I can't be there with you. Um, we basically had two questions regarding uh, water. Uh, one is availability. And while I'm not the expert with Santa Rosa Water on uh, availability, uh, we did we do an urban water management plan on a regular basis. And based upon that uh, urban water ma management plan, there is sufficient water for development uh, for many, many years. Um, yes, there will be uh, uh, one year and multi-year shortages likely in the future. But based on the urban uh, water master plan, uh, we uh, anticipate that there is sufficient volume of water to support uh, developments like this and others throughout the city. Um, the other question that came up earlier was the infrastructure for water in the area. And we have a, a relatively large diameter uh, water main in Chenate. Uh, that it can be fed from both below and above. And any development that goes in the city, we look at our existing infrastructure to see if it's sufficient. And if it's not sufficient, we it's part of the developer cost to uh, upgrade the water system. I don't have the specifics on this project because it hasn't gotten far enough. But uh, it either is sufficient, it is sufficient as it is, or uh, the developer will have to upgrade it as needed. Great, thank you, Andy. Are there other uh, hands raised on Zoom? Yes, we have two more. Kurt and Robin Kundi, I'm gonna send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Hello. I appreciate all the conversation. I would like to ask the developers to consider a compatibility cushion. And what I mean by that is in the areas where they're coming up against what's low density, we'd like to meet low density with low density. Put your medium density in the middle of your cupcake. Um, I do want to see the land developed, but where Tara Linda joins in, to Sinead, there are no sidewalks on Terra Linda, and there's no room really probably to put them. And I also want to bring up to the city, since you're listening, and thank you for that, that people use Sinead Road as a shortcut, and they come through there at 40 miles an hour. And where we turn on to Terra Linda, it's great, it, it's less than a 90 degree turn. It's very unsafe. And my so my final point is that when you did the Sinead sewer project, and I think the city project engineers did a really good job, and I want to thank you for that, but they opened up our cul-de-sac for what was supposed to be one-way traffic and what turned out to not be one-way traffic. And so the people who are coming in and want to live in the apartments and the townhomes that you're going to build, they would already know what neighborhood they're moving into. We moved into a neighborhood where we were on a cul-de-sac. I'm terrified that you're going to permanently open that cul-de-sac and take off 20 feet of our front yard. So, uh, and the other thing I did one day was just sit and count the cars. I went from zero cars a day to 90. And I, 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 will, I will leave. It, it's desperate. So, and everything everybody said about the fires, you can just double that. My mother died of a heart attack during those fires. 
So please be careful. Tom, I'm gonna to send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Tom, I sent you a prompt to unmute yourself. Hello. I just wanted to address one thing. Um, I live up on Cobblestone and we have one fire station that serves Hidden Valley, Montecito Heights, Parker Hill, Cobblestone, Terra Linda. And that fire station burned to the ground during the 2017 fires. It's taken over six years for it even to be considered to be rebuilt. And that will be moving up to Fountain Grove. We will no longer have a fire station in our area. And you're talking about putting an additional 850 units without fire and medical emergency support in the neighborhood. Thank you. Ray and Donna Smith, I'm sending you a prompt to unmute yourself. Yes, I'm Ray Smith, lived here on Hidden Valley Drive for a number of years. Uh, and I've noticed around town uh, quite a bit with some of the other developments, it appears that the uh, parking has been severely uh, under uh, uh, under uh, written in terms of uh, the calculations for for that. Uh, I suspect some of that has to do with uh, when people look at parking. If you go out midday when people are working and do your calculations at that time, it's going to look pretty luxurious. However, if you go around six or seven o'clock at night, uh, at many projects that I've had the occasion to be around, uh, they're severely restricted. Uh, so it'd be very helpful to share with us as the public and homeowners in that area, what are the calculations and do they actually uh, match up with the need that will be there? Thank you. I'm seeing one more comment on Zoom. Jennifer Dion, I'm going to send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Hello? We can hear you. Okay, my name is Rick Dion. I want to say uh, you guys are pretty great for cutting off my wife so early when she was talking on the mic earlier. But uh, yeah, there is a real problem in our backyard and the city of Santa Rosa has denied our claim as far as what is supposed to be built back there as a V ditch and how much water pushes out through our side yard. It's a, a huge concern of ours. And I hope the developer uh, looks at it and make sure that whatever was supposed to be built there back in 1968 is gonna be put there. And uh, that's about it. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Okay, um, at this point, oh, we'll have one more comment. Okay, two two more comments and um, we've got our fire marshal here who wants to say a couple words and then we're gonna close the meeting. So go ahead, sir. Mediation and one of the things that I'm trying to teach my kids is not to assume the worst. So with whatever time I have remaining and if this is valid, I think it would be really helpful for us to hear from, say, the Christoffersons and, and the people up there, uh, um, just some of your reaction, like without having anything prepared, just from the heart, what is your response in a few words? You don't have to have it scripted. What is your response to hearing what you've heard this evening? Because that would show me a lot. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, we'll give a chance for the applicant to respond in just a moment, but go ahead, ma'am. Um, my name is Susanna Korth, um, and I live in Montecito Meadows, and I um, grew up there, um, moved away, came back. Um, and I just want to, um, obviously I'm concerned about everything that everybody has already spoken about. Um, and I just wanna encourage the city to consider some other things from the community and the neighbors. Um, I know I worked in um, real estate lending at banks in various places in the Bay Area specifically. We did a lot in the peninsula in Redwood City, Palo Alto. Um, to cram a project like this into um, as proposed with potentially 900 units into this area just doesn't make any sense, is a terrible fit. Um, I think if you're talking more low density, that's more appropriate. Um, you know, some people may throw out the term NIMBY in other parts of Santa Rosa, but I think I would guess most of the people that are here in this neighborhood, East Santa Rosa, and, you know, my kids go to Hidden Valley School. It's just not, um, we are talking about medium density um, housing. It's not appropriate for the area for all the things people have talked about, fires, traffic, quality of life. Everyone that bought their houses here when Community Hospital was there never in a million years envisioned there being 900 um, units on that one little, you know, 71 acre land. And so from the city standpoint, I know the developer is going to pencil out, you're going to propose a maximum you think you can get and maybe dial it back a little. You're going for the most profitable project possible, but since this, you know, for everyone that's here with the city, um, you are us, you work for the residents. I would encourage you to think outside the box and maybe find, you know, another piece of land as other people have mentioned that's more appropriate for this number of, of proposed units. Thanks. All right, thanks for that. So I'd like to give a moment for um, Paul Lowenthal with our fire department to speak, and then we'll have the applicant say a few words, and then we'll close up. Go ahead, Paul. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Paul Lowenthal, the fire marshal for the city that was also doubling as your occupant load check. So thank you for your patience tonight. Um, I want to take the time to cover a couple things, regardless of what happens with this project. I heard some common themes from the people that were here that I think it's important that everybody understands. We definitely learned a lot from 2017. What happened in 2017 was unacceptable. There's a lot of things that we didn't have control over in 2017 that we've changed how we act and respond today. We've developed zones. So Sinead has three different zones primarily that dump onto Sinead Road, one to the north, two to the south. And we now were one of the only cities in Cal and sorry, in the entire country they had the ability to utilize our own emergency alert systems where we don't have to ask permission from the state or for another agency. We learned a lot of lessons in 17 and we implemented those lessons to a successful evacuation in 2020 for the glass fire. We've heard that people complained about the traffic in 2020, but that was calculated and we knew how much time we had uh, to get those people out of the east side of Santa Rosa. We also recognize that our fire station, our old station five on Parker Hill Road, as well as our new fire station five on Newgate, both burned down. But the location that that fire station is moving to is gonna be at the intersection of, of Stagecoach and Fountain Grove Parkway in an area where we'll have better control over the environment and provide what we refer to as defensible space. Defensible space and new building construction are requirements for what is going to be built in those areas today. There was questions about the potential for insurance. That's something that I monitor personally and professionally. I'm involved in the United Policyholders uh, where we advocate for insurance and look at what changes can be made to benefit policyholders as well as um, insurers. Um, right now, there's risk associated with the area. We've seen uh, open undeveloped lands um, have higher risk when homes, again, regardless of what happens with this project, are built in some cases that can actually reduce the risk because you're taking an undeveloped area and replacing it with requirements where a building is required to be built to current code standards, the required to comply with defensible space and it reduces the, the what the state refers to as risk. And we're seeing some of those risks play out right now in our own city. So areas in, in Santa Rosa that were initially very high fire hazard severity zones that does dictate what happens to your insurance are actually changing where a lot of our very high fire risk areas are being lowered because of what the state is seeing is changes within our communities 
And that also plays into how we respond uh, in general to fires. Um, sorry, there was a bunch of questions that I was trying to hit on. I think hopefully that covered it. Um, but yes, we are very aware of, of the concerns regarding evacuation. And now I did remember what the last thing was. Uh, Sinead Road is one of our evacuation routes. We're very aware of it. So the city of Santa Rosa applied for a fuel management grant and Sinead Road was one of the properties or one of the streets that is actually in a, uh, a wildland urban interface evacuation route clearance program right now. So we're actively actually inspecting a number of properties along Sinead uh, to give us the opportunity to go onto their properties to reduce fuels uh, to help with any future evacuations uh, on that road itself. So hopefully that helped a number of the, a number of the questions and feel free to come up and talk to me afterwards if you have anything else that you'd like to discuss or cover. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, so now I'd like to hand it over to the applicant team for any response. Hello, hello. This is Eddie Haddad. I do wanna thank every single one of you for attending here tonight. It really shows that you care. I mean, if you're here until eight o'clock tonight to listen and we listen to you, it shows that you really care about the community. And doctor, we care too. Remember what we said in the beginning. We don't have all the answers. Doctor, we do not have all the answers. We need to enter into an environmental study. We need to get the answers. We're, we are caring people. We have families too, just like you do. We're trying to propose a project that we feel, based on an initial study that we've done, we shut down the hospital and almost 300,000 square feet of commercial buildings that are shut down you're forgetting to subtract all that traffic from those buildings being shut down. Okay, so we have a lot of credits and we felt like from the initial traffic study that we've done, that this number of units, actually more units than we're proposing right now, our project should develop, should, um, uh, should actually uh, support more units than what we're proposing. We actually came down because we've been working with the nice folks at Friends of Sinead. They're doing a wonderful job representing you folks. So don't, re don't forget that. Okay, um, so we don't have all the answers. We have to work with scientists. You, you know what I'm talking about. We have to work with scientists. We have to get the data. And then upon getting the data, we will adjust accordingly. But it's not like we wanna come and shove a whole bunch of homes down your community, okay? But we have rights too. You know, property owners have rights. I think Paul said it best. Do you like the situation? Do you like looking at the buildings the way they are right now and all that brush? It's just all open territory. It has to be managed. So we have a, a wonderful plan and why not have your home values even increase based on the product type that we will introduce? It's, uh, it's very expensive to build and this is gonna be a, a, an award-winning project. It'll be a project that everybody can benefit from, including you folks, okay? It's not, again, the science will provide, we have to defend our position, okay? It's early on. This was an early meeting, okay? Please let us continue doing the work that we need to do so we can bring an award-winning project for the overall community. And I do thank you for being here. I, I mean, I can't com comment on that right now. Nobody's made any effort to swap any land, but I tell you there are a lot of projects downtown and there's not enough housing on the outskirts of town, okay? In the northeast part of town, there's not enough housing. You know that. There's 20, more, 20 people for every person that's comfortable living in a house right now. There are 20 people that want to get into a house. There's no housing in, in Santa Rosa, especially in the northeast part of town. No, down, only downtown, but not in the northeast section. Right. Okay. So um, if we could get, we want to make sure we, that we've got some time for a quick closure. The meeting's about to end. Um, want to talk to yeah, there'll be. I'd love to meet every, to meet yeah. every one of you.
Let me, let me ask you a okay. question once well, Sonoma County had the property. Hold on just a moment. Um, so the folks on Zoom can't hear any of these questions. So I think generally speaking, your, your concern was about safety and security for the site. Yeah. So Sonoma County had the property. They didn't fence off the property. How do you fence off 72 acres? We have 24-hour surveillance. We have 24-hour security. And you can call me at any time if you ever need anything for the property. We'll respond. We respond. We have... We have weekly reports. We can make those available to you. Absolutely, call me. I'll make sure Jacob and anybody who's on site will respond accordingly. Okay, so um, if there are any more comments or questions, it would be super helpful if we could have folks speak into the microphone so that those folks on Zoom, and this meeting is also being recorded. We wanna make sure that people can, can hear the questions. Yeah, I'd love to meet you. Thank you, folks. I appreciate everybody. And it is after eight, so I just want to make some closing remarks. So there are ways that you can sign up to receive an email bulletin. If you go to the Woodlands at Sinead project page, there's a sign up link at the very top. If you enter your email, um, anytime there's a public, uh, a reason for a public uh, notice to go out, I will um, send an email blast to everybody that's subscribed. And here's uh, the con my contact information, and there's a dedicated email inbox and project website for this uh, project. So if you think of more questions or you want to submit your comments in writing, please email them to woodlands at sinead at src.org. Um, it's best to submit your, your comments in writing so they become part of the project file. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We really appreciate uh, your attendance tonight.